We have had five excellent uh, inputs to the discussion. Uh, the floor is yours uh, first for questions and also for brief uh, comments. I'll take them uh, in sets of three or four, the gentleman in the second row, third row. Trotz yeah. Hase, uh, some of you might know my work from the deprivation index. Uh, I like uh, Dave Perron's uh, sentence there, um, political choice, not a technical uh, necessity. And I think uh, a couple of uh, speakers refer to themselves as uh, positioning themselves somewhere in a global Keynesian uh, solution. And as much as Piketty uh, says when, when in 89 uh, he was christened and that he was vaccinated against Marxism for life, I'm somewhat 20 years older and I cannot refrain from going back to a, a script written in 69 by Tony Negri where he said, what is really the essence of Keynesianism? And I think we really have to come to a political economy debate about what exactly is Keynesianism about. And we all have this U shape before us now as in, uh, published by uh, Piketty and referred to in a couple of things here. So let me say just two sentences about what Tony Negri there said. He said Keynes was the one mainstream or bourgeois economist as, as he would have called him, who understood Marx's theory the state as the ideal collective capitalist. What he understood in 29 was that after the lower classes had shown that they could step outside the system, he understood that the state had to provide some kind of offset in the crisis of 29. So that, then, sentences. Then Sorry, that the market you know. system would then find a new equilibrium on the basis of this offset to, to reintegrate the lower classes. And that gives us a clue to why something happened in 1970 or 80. Because what we see is that there is a different assessment of what is necessary to give as an offset. And that is not a technocratic solution. It's a political solution of what the pressure is that enforces a different offset. Thank you. Uh, Harry Sexton is the name. Just a, a question for Professor Gary, um, the interconnectedness and uh, tax haven issues, uh, I would be curious to know where the political will might come from relating to this, uh, because nation states are quite compromised on global taxation issues. Um, and secondly, uh, would, is, would, would you have a vision for uh, the legal structure or how it might operate? I think they're critical questions because the extent to which there is a global offshore wealth business and offshore to different jurisdictions is an enormous issue and I think in this country we have some difficulties with it because even having a discussion about it because of our relationship with corporation tax and uh, one of the countries that's probably most compromised in relation to this is the United Kingdom for historical reasons and its overseas territories. I think it's an absolutely critical issue, which will probably come up this afternoon with uh, uh, Mr. Piketty. Uh, I just have a question about the gender perspective, um, which I found very, very interesting, um, and the, the whole issue about uh, reevaluating the market kind of um, inequalities there. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the crisis, there's been evidence of changing couple work patterns um, where gender is still very, very important but there is a kind of a, ch a turn in terms of caring responsibilities and so on. And just kind of wondering, has that been looked at in terms of the kind of critical kind of function of these uh, inequalities? The, um, the issue of a political will for, for global taxation, I, I, w I wouldn't say that there is currently a cohesive and coordinated will for, uh, for global taxation. But there is, um, and there are obviously issues with uh, a global legal structure and, and, and issues of how you deal with global, global offshore and wealth. Um, we are perhaps seeing the beginnings of coordination, however, in terms of dealing with the, the blight of tax havens uh, and uh, aggressive tax mispricing and, ta and, and tax management. Uh, obviously, we have the OECD BEPS process, 
which in 2016 might have quite, might have quite significant implications for Irish industrial policy, such as it is. Um, and uh, in terms of a uh, global net wealth tax, although I think that's, that that's very unlikely, we are seeing, for example, movement on the uh, uh, European, Union, European financial transaction tax now, uh, and that is showing that it, it is possible for, for groups of countries uh, within the European Union, for example, to come together on, on, on these issues. So uh, to the extent that that is successful and sets a precedent, might create opportunities for uh, coordination in other areas as well. Um, uh, there's obviously uh, huge political issues in terms of coordination, in terms of the euro area uh, and the EU, but uh, certainly one of the things that we've learned from the post-2008 crisis that the lack of a, a centralized fisc fisc fiscal backstop was a, well, was a huge flaw in terms of the ability of, of Europe to respond to its crisis. And certainly uh, a European-wide net wealth tax could have, could have acted, uh, built up over time, as, as that stopgap. So um, there's only a certain number of types of tax which would be suitable for that role, and net wealth tax would, would be one of them. Um, thank, thank you very much for your um, questions. Um, just in, I'm not necessarily answering them in order, but um, in terms of political pressure, um, I think that's why I'm quite interested in the um, extension of concerns about inequality to a wider population. Uh, in London recently, there was an inclusive capitalism conference where, as I mentioned on the slides, you had uh, Christine Lagarde had Mark Carney, the um, chair of the um, bank in, uh, in England. We also had Prince Charles, one of our royalty, not known for having radical beliefs. Um, and uh, yeah, so, um, so, and I think why they're concerned, so where is the political pressure coming from? Um, I mean, obviously you've had things like Occupy, but they tend to come and go. But I think there is, um, amongst those groups, there is some concern about the extent of inequality, not necessarily because of the damage it does to people's lives, but the damage it does to capitalism itself in terms of enabling um, capitalism to survive in a sustainable way. So I think, curiously, the pressure could be coming from the corporate sector as, as much as the people on the ground. Um, hopefully, well, I don't know. And that, that leads me to the point about Keynes, really, and uh, I'm not sure I fully followed your uh, comment, but um, I think I mean there's a very interesting paper by um, Nancy Fraser who talks uh, uses a lot of Polanyi's work, who talks about the double movement uh, between a free market society and the state, and the state thinking in terms of sort of Keynesian kinds of policies. And her argument, which I would share, is that you know that, that in itself, past solutions have not gone far enough in the sense that they've still retained various hierarchies, especially in the context of gender and especially in the context of relations between the more developed countries and the less developed countries of the world. So some form of bigger transformation is required, but then, you know, I'm, I'm old and um, I prefer reform to revolution. I, I think, you know, the loss of any child is crucial. Uh, so I, I don't want to see any kind of violent conflict. Uh, and in a sense, that's why I find some of the feminist economics work useful, because not only do, you know, say the budget, women's budget group ex um, look at all these small scale changes and demand alternatives to them, but they also look at the bigger picture in terms of thinking, rethinking how the economy itself should be understood. And hopefully one day, you know, they, they may be receive, they, they may get a better reception. Um, in terms of the question about gender and uh, men, um, that, that with changing uh, amounts of uh, employment and so on, whether that will lead to any redistribution of care work. I'm somewhat doubtful. I mean, there have been various studies in the past of particular regions which have been affected by closures of stereotypically male industries. And it leads to some reorganization, but very rarely a change of overall responsibilities. So uh, I'm going to address that question. I think that 
the one about the distribution of responsibilities. And it's been interesting because there's a lot of sort of popular media coverage of that in the United States. Uh, where, you know, and I see it as this, you know, often you get these waves, uh, these phenomenal waves where the media picks up on something that's happening and talks to, you know, a dozen families and then it becomes some sort of social trend. Uh, but in fact, in terms of time use studies, we don't really see that much reorganization, uh, reflecting what, what Diane said, of total, of the responsibilities, the division of responsibilities. Uh, it, it, and it's also interesting, I think, looking at the United States as an example, for instance, that over time, one of the results of women's increasing economic power has been increased defection from child raising among men, right? So this tremendous explosion in single motherhood, and then really a lack of support for social reproduction from the state. And that's one of the issues with thinking about solutions to the questions of care and social reproduction you know, persisting in terms of private solutions and that it's really essential to have a strong public provisioning for social reproduction. And, although along with that, uh, sort of a redistribution of responsibilities and gender norms between women and men is also an essential piece of it, right, in order for there to be really transformative relations. And on that note, I think you can, you know, looking around the world, you can also see how the persistence of traditional gender roles can also cause defection among women from social reproduction, right? And so you have uh, places, you know, in Japan, for instance, a ve very collapsing birth rate, a real uh, collapse in marriage rates, and that is really about women not wanting to uh, enter into traditional marriage contracts. So it's an incredibly complicated, uh, interesting question, but. To, to just sum it up, I think gender roles are incredibly resistant to change, right? Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, just a few thoughts on uh, what is Keynesianism. Um, I mean, there are several Keynesianisms, and uh, I, I like to think about this in terms of post-Keynesianism and uh, a school of thought which has developed in Cambridge after Keynes, uh, and which is, I think, now or has over the last two or three decades develop a more or less coherent research program which can be distinguished from the neoclassical orthodoxy, both in terms of methodology, in terms of topics, and in terms of policy conclusions. Uh, I don't have time to get into all this because this would need another at least 10 minutes, uh, and I'm sure the chair won't give me these 10 minutes. You have a book on that. Uh, yeah, and there's a book out coming by Marc Lavoie on new foundations of post-Keynesian economics, so those who are interested in that should read the first chapter. Uh, the point I want to make is uh, that uh, in this approach, uh, uh, Keynes's idea of the economist as a dentist is not prominent at all. Uh, I mean, in this approach, it is well acknowledged that uh, uh, we are living in a uh, class or social social group based society in which we have we have conflict and in, uh, an idea which rather goes back to the works of uh, uh, Michael Kolecki. Uh, for instance, his political aspects of full employment, uh, which argues that unemployment is a tool, is a, is a tool in the in the fight over income distribution, over the control of the uh, production process. Uh, and this brings me to my, to, to to the point uh, uh, to the first uh, to the second question. Uh, uh, this means that uh, it is not just sufficient to to hint to uh, the deficiencies, for instance, in the financial sector, uh, to the hint that there, there has to be something uh, fixed but uh, that this requires uh, this, uh, conflict, uh, conflict over uh, regulation, conflict over re-regulation, and uh, exactly the way we re-regulate. And I think uh, Keynesians or post-Keynesians in this respect uh, might uh, have to learn or might have to improve on uh, this idea of understanding uh, their discipline, their economics as political economy. And I, my presentation at least tried to be in this spirit. Okay. Thanks, and uh, I'll, I'll, uh, there's much to say to your question, Harry, but uh, just to say a few things uh, along the way. Uh, first, um, I, when we think about interconnectedness and its dangers, uh, we have to link this to thinking about leverage and the fact that through uh, practices such as rehypothecation, we're seeing uh, collateral 
that is used in, mul in multiple ways to, to, uh, as the basis of relationships that are through time um, in which it is assumed that the security involved is available to multiple parties when in fact when they start running out the door it won't be. That's a problem and that has to be uh, really addressed. You know, you, we see this, the, it, in some sense, it's a question of when the fire starts, can we all fit through that door? Um, and if we think that we can, um, then we'll be calm and we'll sit here and listen to speech. But if we fear that we won't, we'll start to head out before the fire goes, uh, even is found. And uh, you see this kind of uh, unwindability um, as it has to have, it, it, we have to have more transparency and more control over uh, basically the collateral that is used uh, as the foundation of these kind of spirals of leverage. That's one point to be made. Maybe a second point uh, going to your legal structure um, and is that uh, essentially uh, actually, before I get to that, a, a, another dimension of this is that in setting these kind of rules, we're going to have to reverse the relationship between the, the central banks and the markets. The central banks have been thrown into a passive or reactive posture by the markets who keep uh, moving ahead. Even in the last several days, we've seen the Federal Reserve experiment with uh, engaging in uh, treasury sales uh, into some of the hedge funds markets and because they, as they are intending to unwind their quantitative easing and to think of raising rates, they aren't sure what implications there are going to be. They are intervening in effect into an echo chamber uh, or, or like a billiards table with many and, and, and it can't be that way. The European money markets melted down um, and had there not been in the, in the crisis and had there not been the Fed to do with its infinite balance sheet, um, we would have seen a, a replay that it would have made 1929 look like child's play. And the thing is that that was resolved very messily in part by governments uh, pledging their fiscal capacity for banks that stepped in in ways that were still unresolved, many of which are reflected on everyone's balance sheets in terms of the mortgage debts and other debts that we all owe. We can't have that. We're not strong enough to sustain a second one, so we've got to change. Unfortunately, it's going to probably take a crisis uh, for us to have another serious discussion, but when that moment comes, we will want to have had serious discussions at the policy level. Now, onto the legal structure question, and I'll just say two things. Um, first, within the European zone, uh, there is tension between, in effect, common law and what you might call Rousseauian law. Um, the, the, from the French tradition, uh, the, the idea of the right of the king. Um, can I create a financial asset I can by the right of the king. Um, can I ask a person to leave their home? Yes, by the right of the king or not. I must ask permission. By contrast, of course, the common law is the idea that you can do something until someone stops you. And those two contrary principles are embedded in, and at war inside the Eurozone. So, and, and the liberalization that's occurred has allowed the expansion of the space for common law type practices, and the idea has been that if, the, if Europe doesn't do it, it won't attract capital from the rest of the world. But if Europe starts to think, in effect, as a developmental area um, to capture the fiscal space for its own social as well as economic reproduction, to renew industry, to think of green jobs and, to, and alternatives for young people, it may very well need to think very differently about the relationships across borders. There's much more to be said, I'll leave it there, but one other thing that really should be flagged is a very dangerous, important development that again, even this week there, were, there was uh, something that happened of importance. That is to say that when we securitize, we're creating, we have, uh, we're creating a second claim on an income stream. 
I lend to you, and you then uh, basically have, we have this relationship. You're my borrower. But if I bundle and securitize this asset, we've now got, and I sell it to Marissa, you know, for, for example, you know, we've got then uh, two claims that are at war uh, or are in tension. And what's happened is that the global financial markets have, in effect, asserted the right of those holding this paper, this secondary claim, over and above any relationship that the lender has with that primary claim. And so in a sense, if you will, the globalized financial relationships become the guardian of what's really legal, who owes what to whom. This is something that we're seeing this week with the Supreme Court decision about the Argentinian debt. You saw an immediate follow-up wherein six hedge, fu or hedge funds uh, and other uh, private equity funds have now sued the six mega banks in the, in the United States on the basis of fraudulent claims for securities they bought completely oblivious to the original claimants and the original, uh, the original cash flows. This kind of thing, we're in an Alice in Wonderland backwards world. We've really got to address these kinds of things. It's the people serving the financial system rather than the opposite. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I'm not an economist. Uh, I work more in the area of, uh, I suppose, political economy of communication. And I was struck by the panel referring to themselves, I think, implicitly at least as a bunch of Keynesians um, and wondering well, how you define Keynesians. What's the essence of Keynesians in, in the moment that we're in um, right now? Where on the one hand, we have an increasing popularity of the attention and interest in economic inequality in a way that has not been seen for 30 years, at least in my experience. And then we have a rather cautious approach to policy uh, coming from our speakers, where capital flight is almost taken as a given, as a, as a for granted. And yet, dealing with capital flight is, seems to be crucial to any kind of policy that's going to grasp the uh, moment, the political moment, as, as, as it were. So I just wonder if, in terms of the sense that Keynesianism wasn't just a technical approach to economics, it was actually about a political moment in history, um, and I would agree with the first uh, one of the questioners over there in that regard. Uh, my question then would be, as a basic element for Keynesianisms or those Keynesians people who are advising uh, social democratic governments in Europe uh, and parties in Europe, at a minimum, should not this moment now mean that Keynesians, uh, Keynesians would take the position of a uh, robust, full support for a robust EU-wide corporation tax and wealth tax? Should that not be a minimum program on which all Keynesians could at least do something at the European Union level that could not be done at the national level? Hello there, Audrey Dean, St. Vincent de Paul, Social Justice and Policy. Um, that's a Catholic lay organization interested in social justice and policy for our European comrades today. This is a specific question for you, Dan, Tom. Tom. And it's in relation to the just published uh, country specific recommendations for Ireland. Uh, and given the new terrain we're now in due to our exit from the bailout, I'm wondering have you got a quick comment about? perhaps lack of discussion of that in the country-specific recommendations. And just briefly with regard to a stronger European cohesion around uh, wealth tax, uh, given Juncker, Juncker's arrival and Merkel's humiliation in Germany and reminder of her democratic brief, could you just make some comment on the perhaps potential for a stronger move towards a wealth tax at European level? One last question. Yes, there was the gentleman on the third row. Very brief, please, we are really yes. out of time. Okay, David Jacobson is my name. A um, couple of paradoxes that strike me, and I wonder what your response is to it. One, it seems to me that there's a great deal of kind of institutional path dependency that makes everything very difficult to change. On the other hand, markets are very short-termist in their reactions to everything, and yet there's an essential need for change, and all of you have called for change, and yet there is a kind of institutional resistance to that where, for example, men are in power so the possibility of gender equality is reduced. Uh, people who, who have wealth are in power so the possibility of wealth tax is reduced. Thank you. One and a half minutes each then. Gary. 
Right. Actually, uh, just a quick comment about uh, Keynesianism and, um, and about wealth tax. It, first, it, it, it seems to me that uh, you're, there, there, this connection between political will and the, uh, you know, the extent to which uh, the people are willing to, let's say, pass, for example, something like the tax that would be on people with more than a million uh, euros in wealth. That has to do with transforming the, the discourse and, uh, and that has to do with who we blame. And uh, one of the points I've been uh, trying to suggest is that because we have re we, we've seen governments recruited to help finance capital, uh, those governments are perceived as no longer the friends of the working people. And to that extent, you know, turning around and, and adopting a Keynesian approach will require a, a bold leadership from our political spokespeople. And on the financial issues, we're going to need um, them to listen to people other than the markets. And the, if we go up and down the street, even in Montier Street where FEX is in Brussels, we will see all the flags of the Bank of Boston and the other big institutions. They are there in force. This second comment maybe would be just to say that, um, you know, there's a debate. Uh, uh, Jamie Galbraith reviewed Piketty's book and had some critiques and, um, and followed it up with an essay. And in a sense, um, there, it, it goes to the question of, of uh, first of all, is Keynesianism necessary? And then secondly, um, uh, you know, kind of, is this a crisis of capitalism or a crisis of policy? Piketty, in a sense, says that it's a crisis of capitalism, that this inequality that he's gonna talk to us about is coming from this machine that's been working for a very long time. And we should understand it in that frame. Um, and I think all that's been said about, well, do we deal with it globally and locally? And I completely agree with Tom that we, we can't wait for tomorrow on this. Um, that said, notice that in Piketty's book, there's not discussion of Keynesianism to the, in, in the sense that some of our colleagues at the table here are discussing the need for social reproduction programs. Go back to the earlier discussion today uh, the idea of well-being linked to participation in community, caring for the other, the kinds of things that we normally think we're going to need governments to help with, even to do your time, uh, I, I got your time is up, even to do your uh, child care. Um, that said, uh, basically, you know, we're going to have to see this agreement that this crisis of capitalism also needs a renewal of Keynesianism and we, we, I think that we have to embrace both concepts rather than being positioned to have to choose between them. Yeah, just to keep the answer short, I mean, uh, of course, re-regulating finance is one of the key issues of uh, a Keynesian or post-Keynesian approach towards this. Uh, and uh, 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 regulating uh, uh, capital flows, uh, I think, for me, is an, is, is an, is an uh, inherent or an important uh, aspect of this. So, uh, if I had had more time, I would have uh, uh, explained this uh, in my uh, three three pillars strategy. Uh, whether I would be in favor of a European-wide cooperation and wealth tax, uh, at the very end, perhaps uh, we should rather go for some tax harmonization, as far as I would see it. So, uh, establish some corridors for uh, for different tax rates, uh, and this is given the present situ situation, of course, politically uh, highly ambitious. But uh, of course, I would fully agree with that, that we should move in this direction. Anisa. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make, in terms of, the, of having a European-wide uh, tax rate, draw your attention, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, the tax competition in the U uh, U.S. states, right, that we have different state level corporate taxes. This has been talked about for a long time. You, you know, there's a lot of agreement about it. You don't, you can think that taxes are too high or, you, or that they need to be, corporate taxes need to be higher, or they need to be low and still come to an agreement about tax competition. But we haven't been able to come to that place uh, 
despite all of this wasteful uh, spending. So I think that's an instructive experience to consider. Now, also in terms of the, the, the question about institutional resistance to change, you know, taking a gender perspective is uh, interesting in this regard because, you know, as we know, sort of gender inequality has been around for a long time, much longer than capitalism. Uh, there's some ways in which gender, in which patriarchy really uh, was um, suffered under capitalism, but some ways that it's been reconstituted. And I think as, as Diane brought out in some of her de gender budget work, that there are some elements that to, to reform that are potentially gender conflicted in the sense that increasing social or economic power can mean, will mean decreasing social and economic power. Uh, increasing social and economic power for women may mean decreasing social and economic power for at least some men. So uh, I think that the, uh, you know, my relationship to Keynesianism or sort of shifting away from capitalism, you're right that I have sort you know, kind of a, a mixed feelings about what the alternatives are because uh, of these kinds of contradictions. Which, okay. um, 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 yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, just going back to the questions, I think it's um, necessary to do something about the processes generating inequalities uh, sort of ex ante rather than relying entirely on uh, you know post ex post redistribution <clears throat> having said that I'd be in favor of many kind of wealth taxes of all kinds to do something to address the very very high levels of inequality at the moment um, you know as an academic I can't make it's very hard to make suggestions, specific suggestions for policy, but I think academic work can be very useful. I mean, I think the work of Tom and, say, the Women's Budget Group, which kind of shows that small changes can have quite large impacts, and I think that they could be very politically persuasive. So I think it's very important for academics and uh, policy makers to work together on these kinds of issues uh, to try to make a more persuasive case uh, for redistribution and attacking the processes generating the inequality in the first place. Yeah, that's a lot of questions for, for 90 seconds. On the country-specific recommendations, um, we've had recommendations now from the IMF and, and, and from the Commission in, in, in the last few weeks, and of course from the Fiscal Council. And um, they, they, they focus on a lot of areas from reform of, le of, of legal services to childcare facilities, and so on, but, but obviously the one that people focus on is the, the extent to which there is a fiscal effort this year by, by government. And, and I would be concerned that a lot of that advice is often based upon uh, flawed methodology. Uh, there's an overemphasis on the deficit, in, on the public deficit in a particular year, not enough emphasis on inequality, employment outcomes, poverty, well-being, the potential damage that can be wrought through hi what are known as hysteriasis effects. Uh, which, which can lead to higher levels of structural unemployment, which reduce the level of potential output of the economy. Policies that are enacted in this year's, in this year's budget will affect the long-term potential output of the economy. They will, they will reduce it. That affects the structural budget and it affects it, the structural deficit and affects the, the, the actual deficit. It is foolish and, and, and being overly tactical rather than strategic in simply focusing on getting to 3% of GDP in 2015. I'm, I'm also flabbergasted at the confidence with which uh, they make their assertions, uh, particularly w with regard to uh, unobservable var variables such as the structural balance. Uh, and a lot, of their, a lot of their analysis is on Ireland's structural balance being X, when in fact we can't actually measure it. And in fact, it's a moving target because it depends upon potential output, which in itself depends upon policy. So uh, I think there needs to be greater balance to the debate and perhaps a, a greater degree of rigor from the interna international in institutions, some of which have not exactly covered themselves in glory over, over the last few, few years, particularly the EU Commission. Uh, in terms of the, the feasibility and desirability, and I know I'm finished, uh, of uh, European-wide corporation uh, tax uh, and wealth tax, I think certainly uh, it, to prevent the race to the bottom effect that is uh, generating and exacerbating inequalities. There needs to be uh, EU-wide floors on the effective 
uh, tax rates for multinationals. There needs to be more assertive uh, and proactive treatment of how we deal with tax havens uh, and the interactions uh, and tax arbitrage uh, um, strategies used by multinationals. And, and hopefully the BEPS process will begin the process of dealing with that. That doesn't necessarily mean that all countries have to have the same corporation tax rate because they have different structures and uh, some countries have, have advantages which others do not, for example, transportation advantages. Uh, on a European-wide wealth tax, uh, I think certainly that is something that is economically feasible in the medium term. Uh, I don't see any uh, insurmountable difficulties from an economic perspective as to why that would be impossible. Politically, of course, it, it might be very, very difficult, although I would note that, that many of the countries that have wealth taxes at the moment uh, are places like Switzerland, France, Norway, and so on, countries which haven't exactly proven to be uncompetitive. Uh, a net wealth tax doesn't have to be a barrier to, to economic growth uh, and would certainly improve uh, levels of inequality. So to f answer the question, uh, yes, we should be moving towards a European tax on net wealth. Yes. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our speakers and our contributors from the floor for this very discussion. And now we have to think about the material basis of life and reproducing our labor, and our colleague from TASP will help us with that. Oops, sorry. Now, ladies and gentlemen.